So hello and welcome to another episode of Top Tens. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood. Yes, that's my real name and my shirt does have dinosaurs on it. And today we're talking about 10 punishments that don't exactly fit the crime. And as always, this video is based on original scripts submitted by one of our many handsome, well-endowed writers. This one being Ian Forty. You can find links to their work below alongside my own. But let's get to it. If you cannot do the time, don't do the crime is a fairly well-known saying that dates back some years now, and the meaning of the idiom is simple enough. Be prepared for the consequences of your own actions. Which sounds pretty straightforward on the surface, but sometimes the consequences are curiously off balance compared to the actions, and people don't always know that ahead of time. For that reason, if you plan on doing any crime, familiarise yourself with the punishments beforehand so you don't run into any of the situations like these. And just don't do crime, and if you do do crime, don't tell people that I told you to do crime. I'm reading from a script, and that script is obviously a joke. Don't do crime. Crime is bad. Anyway, number 10. Owning a bald eagle feather can get you sent to prison and fined for good measure. Bald eagles have been a symbol of America since 1782, and in 1978, the birds were listed as endangered. Good news for eagle fans, though, in 2007, they actually got off the endangered species list thanks to huge efforts to save the species, and now it's not even threatened any longer. But the road to that success was paved with pretty harsh rules for anyone who dared cross paths with the majestic bird. For starters, hunting and killing bald eagles is very much illegal, which makes plenty of sense. Like, I don't know many countries where shooting the national animal is going to not get you in trouble. What makes a little less sense though is that possessing anything to do with a bald eagle is also illegal. That means if you have, say for example, a bald eagle feather, you're committing a crime, even if you just like found it on the ground and picked it up thinking it looked pretty. And this is all thanks to something called the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act of 1940, which makes it illegal for anyone to take one of these birds or anything to do with them, including nests, eggs, and yes, feathers. The language of the act makes it clear it's preventing people from hunting and poaching the birds, focusing specifically on trafficking and selling, but possess is specifically mentioned as well, and it's a very nebulous term that allows for, you know, people just finding a feather on the ground to get fined and sent to prison. And how big is that fine, you ask? Well, the punishment for a first offence can net a fine of $100,000 and or a year in prison. And in fact, legally only members of recognized Native American tribes may possess the feathers legally, which is used for certain ceremonial purposes. So keep in mind that these are the maximum penalties and you probably won't be fined and imprisoned if you just find a single feather. That said, you could definitely be forced to return it and if you refuse, legal action may then be taken. Yeah, don't mess with the feathers then I suppose. Number nine, Thai cops are punished with Hello Kitty armbands. There's a certain train of thought that says humiliation is a suitable form of punishment. Think of the scarlet letter and the idea that an adulterer be branded so that all can see them and mock their indiscretion. Psychologists don't necessarily agree that humiliation is ideal, especially for kids, but it still happens. In Thailand, for example, if members of the police department are found to have broken some of the rules, their punishment can be meted out with a noticeable and humiliating brand. In this case, it's a bright pink Hello Kitty armband, which to me just sounds rad, but I guess a big burly police officer might disagree. Police are supposed to be role models for following the rules. If a cop is caught littering or parking illegally, they get put on desk duty with the armband for their co-workers to see. They're spared the shame of having to work out in the public wearing it, so the shame of being among fellow officers is supposed to be enough. And again, it just sounds rad like, I, do I have it? Well, in, in some videos you'll see my Hello Kitty mug. I love that thing. Number eight. Touching a member of the Thai royal family was a capital offence. You know, sticking with Thailand, the country's rules proved to be so daunting that in one extreme example, they backfired quite horribly. This occurred in 1880 when Queen, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, Sunanda Kumaraitana was vacationing with her family and crossing a river by boat with her daughter. The current was strong and the boat capsized. Which, yeah, sucks, but there were many guards and servants about, and you think someone would have rushed to save the Queen's life. Life, but you'd be wrong. One law of the land at the time stated that no one was allowed to touch a member of the royal family for any reason under pain of death. Any touch could be considered a capital crime. As such, the queen and her daughter both drowned as dozens of onlookers watched on. The king is said to imprison everyone who could have saved them despite their adherence to the law, then abolish the law altogether so it could never happen again. Number seven, attempted suicide has been criminalized in many countries. So most people generally recognize a suicide attempt as a symptom of a mental illness of some kind and likely linked to depression. Those who attempt suicide can be arrested or detained in hospitals, but the hope is that the person will be able to see a doctor and get help to find the root cause of why they tried to take their own life. Well, that's the ideal outcome anyway. In many places, especially in the past though, a suicide attempt was simply 
vilified. Up until the 1950s, for example, Britain criminalised suicide attempts and a small portion of offenders were sentenced to jail time. Go back even further to the 13th century and if someone did commit suicide, their surviving family was punished and all of their possessions were taken by the government. Though England eventually decriminalised attempts, not everyone did. In many countries, it is still in fact a crime. The Bahamas, for example, has the stiffest laws on the books for offenders and if someone survives, they can be sentenced to life in prison for it. Number six, DreamWorks animators were punished by having to work on Shrek. So moving on to something altogether more wholesome, most jobs have a process for dealing with employees who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. In extreme cases, if you commit a crime beyond the confines of work, they'll just call the police. But within the realm of poor performance, you may get fired, or at worst, written up for a small scale offence. Some businesses have three strikes ruled before a firing, or maybe you'll just have to take some training again to prove you can do the job expected of you. DreamWorks Animation opted for a more, shall we say, unusual approach to punishment after the studio was first formed. The studio's first movie, The Prince of Egypt, was done with traditional animation. Remember, this was the mid-90s, and computer animation was not really a thing yet. Pixar had only just released Toy Story in 1995. With this in mind, when an animator was found to have messed up in some way on the production of Prince of Egypt, they were sent to work on Shrek as a punishment. Shrek started production around 1995, but it wasn't released for six years. The movie had gone through numerous changes, including character designs and voice actors, and was treated like the ugly stepchild of the studio that no one believed would ever get made, let alone succeeded. And the Oscar goes to Shrek, Aaron Warner. Animators called the punishment being Shrek, and why was it so maligned? Because when it was first pitched, the story was terrible, the budget was minuscule, and the studio had hired a bunch of recent grads with no experience to work on it. Work was done in an ugly warehouse, and the team kept changing as people walked out or were simply fired. And because it lasted years, to many, it must have seemed endless. <laughs> Getting Shrek. Oh, number five, etiquette breaches at Oxford were punishable by drinking beer. One thing people tend to find quite disagreeable is when an organisation polices itself and meets out punishments that are, by most measures, ineffective. Police officers getting suspended for egregious crimes is an extreme example of things, but schools are known to behave in a similar manner. Oxford, a prestigious old university that you all know, those who breach etiquette in some way suffered a penalty called sconcing. Which is, it's no shrekking, but it'll do. These breaches could include poorly speaking Latin or talking about women. Just in general, I guess. Pint of beer. In some cases, everyone gets to drink at the same time. In others, it's something of an elaborate drinking game that can get everyone drunk if done right. In other versions, a person has to propose a sconce by accusing the others of some act. Anyone guilty of that act must drink. You may recognise this as basically, never have I ever, with a sillier name. Never have I. That's a good game. Here's the thing. If I was out with a couple of people and they've like put some beers down in front and went, would you like to sconce? I would stand up and leave, thank them for their time and go home and play Baldur's Gate 3. Number four. A teen was tried as an adult for sending selfies of a minor. Parentheses. Himself. One of the most infamous crimes we've been emboldened by the computer age has been the proliferation of videos and images of child pornography and exploitation. Whole task force have been set up to stop this and there have been cybercrime units across the globe that deal with these issues. And while that is absolutely something that needs to be dealt with, it's not always dealt with in the right way. In North Carolina, a 17 year old boy was tried as an adult for possessing nude photos of an underage person. That's obviously a crime we hear you saying, but we should point out that person was himself. The pictures were selfies he'd taken when he was 16. And despite this obviously being like, you know, an exception to the rule. The boy ended up taking a plea deal just to keep himself off the sex offender register and avoid jail time. And remember, this is for having photos of himself. His charges included four counts of making and possessing images of himself and one count of having a photo of his girlfriend, who was, at the time, the same age. The girlfriend in question was also charged and took a similar plea deal. In both cases, they were the adult perpetrator and minor victim of the same crime. And as ridiculous as this sounds, it's happened multiple times. For example, a 15-year-old girl in Ohio was facing similar charges a few years earlier. And the FBI has had several other examples on file. Number three. George R.R. Martin's punishment for avoiding Vietnam was being called a coward. Numerous people came out against the Vietnam War draft back in the 1960s, and Game of Thrones writer George R.R. Martin was chief among them. He applied for conscientious objector status, which would exclude him from going to war, and according to Martin, he was granted it very quickly. But it did come 
with an altogether unsavoury price. Martin said that the draft board decided that Martin would be punished by being branded a coward for life as a result of his actions. And, well, that would be a suitable burden to bear, but it seems like he's handled it pretty well. You know, the whole success of Game of Thrones. Season 8 with standing. Number 2. More than one school has taken away a cane from a blind student. Education is considered a vital part of any child's life and upbringing, but if the news has taught us anything as adults, it's that schools are constantly fumbling the ball in new and creatively horrible ways. For instance, when it comes to the punishment of blind children. Sure, a blind child could have issues with discipline like any other child, and they would need to be addressed, but you think that anyone with a lick of common sense might think twice before taking away the child's cane. You know, the thing that allows them to see, for lack of a better term, and interact with the world around them. Nonetheless, it's happened multiple times. For example, in Kansas City, an eight-year-old child had their cane taken away and replaced with a pool noodle after he was accused of hitting someone on the bus with it. I shouldn't laugh, but the word pool noodle always sends me. The child, who we should point out was born without eyes, is known to fidget and sometimes raise their cane just to move it around. The bus driver reported this as the child being violent instead of just, you know, them not being able to see where their cane is, because they don't have eyes. Over the pond here in the UK, a student was banned from using her cane because the school felt it was a risk to others who might trip over it. They can't see. Like, of the two things, I know one thing that's more of a tripping hazard, and it's the person who's blind not having their cane. Number one, until 2009, there was no punishment for selling a child in Mississippi. Oh, Mississippi. Oh, never change. Oh, even though you should. For many of these stories, we've seen a punishment that seemed too extreme for the crime. In a few, the punishment was more of a joke that didn't match the crime for the opposite reasons. And finally, we're on to one where the crime seems unbelievably egregious, and the only thing more unbelievable is that there's no punishment at all. Until the year 2009, there was no punishment in the state of Mississippi for selling a child, as in an actual living human child. It technically wasn't a crime. This only came to light because in 2008, a woman tried to sell her granddaughter for $2,000 and a car. The woman was only charged with a probation violation unrelated to the incident because they couldn't find a valid crime on the books to charge her with as it relates to, and this cannot be stressed enough, attempting to sell an entire human being for a car. When the case came to light, a new law was proposed and passed, letting Mississippi leap into the 19th century, just a couple hundred years too late. Of interest, however, is that there's still technically no federal law prohibiting the sale of children. A law was passed to protect them from sex trafficking, but the language omitted the sale of children for black market adoptions or just for good old-fashioned profit. So that's the thing. So thank you everyone for tuning into this episode of Top 10s. I've enjoyed recording this video. Hopefully you enjoyed listening to me read the script. And if you did like that script, why not give the author a follow on Twitter? Is it tw X? Tw it's Twitter. Or the other socials linked below alongside my own. Also, you know, if you like the video, leave a like. If you've got a comment about it, or maybe like, you know, some other obscure laws you know about or a topic you'd like us to cover, let us know about those in the comments too. Finally, I'd like to just ask for some feedback on my presentation and hosting style, which I've been trying to refine into something more fitting for the channel, but also in line with my own presentation and hosting style over on my own channels, Fact Fiend and Wiki Weekends. You know, it's, a, it's an ongoing learning process and I'm happy to respond to and uh, deal with feedback. Yeah, but you know, if you like these videos and want to see more of them, you know, subscribe for more. And as always, I'd like to wish everyone watching at home the day they deserve. Cheers. <laughs>